on your Monday media day edition of Locked On Raptors. No one seems to think the Raptors are going to be very good this year, but at least everyone's on the same page about it. You are Locked On Raptors, your daily Toronto Raptors podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Hey, what's going on? And welcome to another episode of Locked On Raptors, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. It is Monday, September the 30th. And I'm your host, Sean Woodley. I've been covering the Toronto Raptors now, going on 11 seasons on various platforms. You can find all my work over on the really bad website that sucks, at Woodley Sean. You can find the show on Instagram at Locked On Raptors. And of course, you can join us in the Locked On Raptors Discord server, baby. The link is in the description of the podcast. Great place to come hang out. It's where I'll be talking about games for the most part throughout this season and not on the hell website that sucks. And it's just a great little listener family we got building around the show. Even if we disagree on things, we do it nicely and with uh, some friendship and happiness and good vibes. So come hang out with the Good Vibes crew over in the Lockdown Raptors Discord server. Of course, you can find the show for free on your favorite podcast apps and on YouTube. Follow, subscribe, rate, review, etc., etc. You know the deal by now. Please go do all those things. Uh, of course, today's show is also brought to you by our friends over at FanDuel. You can start the season with a big return on FanDuel. Place your $5, first $5 bet, and you'll get your, your season started with 200 bucks in bonus bets guarantee, guaranteed. Visit FanDuel.com to get started. And we'll get started here in just one second, digging into media day takeaways after Masai Ujiri, Darko Ryakovich, a whole lot of players took the day as fielded questions from the assembled media, yours truly included. Before we do that, however, just want to acknowledge that today is the National Day for Truth and Reconciliation here in Canada. A uh, very important day for getting educated, for uh, just reading up and being aware and thoughtful of the horrible history of residential schools in this country. There's a link in the description of this podcast to the international, uh, sorry, excuse me, the Indian Residential School Survivor Society, which is a really important charity that does great work to support the victims of the residential school system and the survivors and families who are still suffering from generational trauma as a result of said residential school system. Uh, I'll be donating some money today on behalf of Lockdown Raptors. Would love to see uh, if we can get some other donations through you, the listeners as well. A uh, really important day and wanted to not kick off this podcast without acknowledging the Nas National Day for Truth and reconciliation. Um, with that, we will pivot into today's show, digging into the media day uh, that the Raptors held down at Scotiabank Arena. Again, you know, love media day. School day vibes, first day of school vibes. Emmanuel quickly was asked about the first day of school vibes of it all. It's just kind of how it goes. It's a, it's a fun, sort of refreshing reset on the new year. And for me, the biggest takeaway overall, we'll get into stuff on the defense, we'll get into stuff on uh, Emmanuel quickly. No rebrand. Uh, and, uh, you know, obviously the really upsetting news of Dikembe Mutombo's passing as well. Masai Ujiri had some beautiful words about Dikembe today I want to talk about at the end of today's show. But uh, off the top, you know, sort of big takeaway for me is that everyone's on the same page, which was not seemingly the case a year ago where it was awkward and bizarre and Pascal Siakam is kind of getting shots thrown at him and kind of being vaguely called selfish even i don't think it was never really directed at pascal siakam specifically but the way it was framed sure made it seem like it was uh it was a really awkward media day a year ago where the direction of the team felt completely in flux that very much not the case this time around which i think is good it's refreshing it's nice and look I don't think anyone's under the illusion that this team's going to be very good this year. It was basically a repeated run of guys being like, yeah, you know, it'd be great if we could go win some games, but we we know we're realistic. We know it takes a lot to win in this league and we kind of don't have a lot right now to work with. Talent level's not super high. Um, you know, young players, it's a hard league to win when you're really young. All of these things, very true. And it was nice to hear, you know, just sort of, I think some realism about this roster and sort of what it holds. I think the Masai Ujiri winning count was pretty low. Typically, he's going to you know bang the winning drum a whole bunch. We're going to win in Toronto. We're going to win. We're going to win. Uh, that was not something that was a, at the forefront of his media availability today. I do think one thing that was a very common through line from everybody who spoke from Masai Ujiri, Darko Ryakovich, and all the, players, all the players on down 
is that this is a year for building a foundation, for getting everybody on the same page, for sort of picking up the pieces from the last couple of seasons where things have been in disarray. Last year in particular, where just like not a whole lot got done, not a whole lot got set in motion, not a whole lot in terms of principles and core pillars of what the Scotty Barnes era Raptors are going to look like got laid into the ground. This is the year for laying that foundation. Darko Ryakovich had a whole analogy about how right now with this team, it's about kind of digging the hole that you build when you're building a house and building the foundation in the basement. And that's where a lot of the work goes in. And then you build up from there. Masai Ujiri used the R word, rebuilding. And look, I think that is sort of the, the key word that a lot of people will fixate on. Because rebuilding, for some people, means be really bad and tank and try to lose as many games and be the Portland Trailblazers. I don't think that's always what rebuilding means. It could be that they tank by season's end. That very well could be on the docket here. But I don't think it's going to happen before some really important steps take place for the long-term building of what this thing is going to be. And I, I think, you know, this is going to be a season where, sure, lottery balls will inevitably be part of the conversation. They're going to clearly be spending this year, though, I, I think trying to set some core principles in place. And I don't think that they're going to you know, go down the tubes at the expense of setting up those core principles. This is not going to be a team that 35 games into the season starts resting guys and you know having fake boo-boos and injuries keeping guys out of the lineup. They're going to want to have guys in there as long as they can. And the nice thing is, if you're the kind of person who wants high lottery position, is that these guys can play most of the season and they'll still probably lose enough games to be pretty bad and in the lottery conversation, right? It's just how the roster's set up. As Emmanuel quickly said, you know, they might not be the most talented team there is, but that doesn't mean you don't go out and compete and put things together and sort of try to get moving in the same direction with one another. And I think that's ultimately going to be the prevailing story of this season based on uh, the takeaway, you know, the, well, well, the takeaways from everybody today, right? From Jakob Pertl to Grady Dick, Masai, Darko Ryakovic, it just seems like everyone's on the same page. Everyone knows the deal. Everyone knows this season is not entirely about building and, and you know, winning as many games as possible. Jakob Pertl talked about how this is not going to be the type of year where they're going to win 65 games and trying as hard as they can to milk every single win they can at the expense of player development. You know, that's the Nick Nurse model, right? That team made more sense for them to go that model with Nick Nurse, you know, when they were in those last couple seasons before he got let go. This season is going to be more about giving dudes run, giving dudes grace, giving guys opportunities. And Again, setting up core principles that can kind of carry this team forward as guys age into their primes. They're still a very young team. And I, I think, you know, you can use the word rebuild all you want. I, I think it can mean different things. I, I think the, the sort of the way they seem to be using it is more in the sense of rebuilding just like how this team plays basketball and the core tenets of what they want to do and getting things in motion, getting guys on the same page. There was a lot of talk this offseason about kind of getting started on that process early in Spain when Kelly Olynyk, RJ Barrett right off of losing in the Olympics with Canada went right to Spain and started working because they just wanted to get some reps and time spent with a group of guys that really got no time together of any sort of note last year at all outside of a few weeks in February where lo and behold things look pretty good but the injuries spelled the end of that to Scotty Barnes and Yaka Pertl in particular you had Emmanuel quickly, RJ Barrett missing time for bereavement last season too, down the stretch, and, and any hope of building some kind of continuity and consistency last season just didn't exist. And so that really is what this season is going to be all about. And I'm glad to hear that, man. I'm glad to hear everyone's united on the same page. Jakob Pertl, a veteran, a guy who's been around the block, I, I thought what he had to say today was really encouraging, speaking about how you know, it doesn't just have to be that you're on a championship level team for it to be fun to be in the NBA. You can be on a team that's not very good, but that it's building towards something that's playing cohesive, interesting basketball that's building towards something down the line and sort of a grander vision. And that can be a really fun and fulfilling thing, too. I think Kelly Olynyk also echoed a lot of this, just kind of wanting to be part of something where he can, you know, impart wisdom and experience to the younger dudes and be part of, again, sort of bringing up the collective. I, I, I think 
it felt like a pretty harmonious and in line message from everybody who spoke today, which is just a far cry from what we saw last year. And to me, that's kind of all I needed to hear. I, I did not need to hear them come out and claim they're going to go in 45 games and push for the playoffs or whatever. Um, you know, I don't think that's really on the table for this team. I do think, as Jakob Pertl said, there's a chance for them to surprise a bit. This is not your typical rebuilding team as much as everyone wants to use the rebuilding term to say, ooh, they're going to be really terrible and they're going to take many, many years to do this thing. They're not, as Jakob Pertl put it, starting from zero. There is more talent on this roster than your run of the mill trying to be really bad at the bottom of the lottery tanking team. It may end up being that the league is good enough and the East is strong enough and injuries come into play and they end up being in that sort of high lottery range. I, I would doubt it. I think they're probably more in the sort of like 7, 8, 9, 10, 11 range of the lottery when all is said and done. But it, they're not starting from a point where they've got nothing. They've got Scotty Barnes. They've got Emmanuel Quickly. They've got RJ Barrett. They've even got Grady Dick, who I have really high, high hopes for this season all of whom are you know, as important as getting lottery position and adding future talent, you got to also nurture the guys you have now. And it seems like that's what this team wants to do this year. And to me, that's really all I needed to hear, that they're going to try to play some serious, real basketball, get these guys coached up, and you know, just kind of playing, again, a system that can be improved upon and built upon going forward. And it starts for this team, I think, on the defensive end, I want to get into that, which I think was a pretty encouraging thing as well. Coming out of media day to talk about defense, talk about being a little more aggressive. We're going to get into what the Raptors might be cooking on the defensive end based on what we heard from media day coming up in just one second. Today's show is brought to you by friends over at game time, the single best place to buy tickets for the sporting events you want to go to Raptors games are coming up. Maybe you're in Montreal and you want to go to the preseason game against the wizards on Sunday. Game time is going to have those seats for you and they're going to have the best seats for you because they have wonderful features to help you get the very best deals. Uh, it's a wonderful thing. Game time picks. They just filter out all the fluff and get you those seats that you want. You don't got to sort through all the stuff you can't afford. Just get the stuff you can't afford and you want to pay for, and you are off and running. Game time, their create curation makes it easier to save more on sports, concerts, comedy, and theater. That If you can toggle on the all-in pricing as well, super handy feature. It shows the total up front with no surprise fees at checkout, and you also get panoramic views from your seats. Maybe you're going to that Montreal, Montreal game this week, and you've never been to the arena in Montreal. You want to know what the sight lines are like, Guess what? The, you can get those sight lines with the wonderful seat views over at Game Time as well. Take the guesswork out of buying tickets with Game Time. Download the Game Time app, create an account, and use the code Locked in NBA for twenty bucks off your first purchase. Terms apply. Again, create an account and redeem the code Locked on NBA, all one word, for twenty dollars off. Download Game Time today. What time is it? Well, it's Game Time, of course. Back at it here on your Media Day Takeaways episode of Locked On Raptors and getting a little more into the nitty gritty here, into the specifics of what the building process is going to look like this year for the Raptors. I want to talk a bit about defense. Darko Ryakovic was asked about it. All the guys seem to be asked about it in one way or another. Uh, shout out to our boy Samson Folk. Uh, ask him the important questions. Defense questions, baby. We love defense questions. And uh, yeah, I, I think we got a little bit of a glimpse at what is hopefully a thing they can improve upon from last year, where they were, I believe, 26 in defensive efficiency last year, depending on where you look. One way or another, they were like a bottom five defense last season. It was a total abject failure to stop anybody. I, I think the thing that really stood out to me today was Stark Aryakovic alluding to ball pressure and aggressiveness kind of being a little bit more part of the equation for them this year. This was not a very aggressive defensive team last year. It was kind of just a team that sat back and waited for offense to happen to them. Uh, and there, there wasn't like, I, I, I talked about this before, there wasn't a whole lot in terms of like, okay, this is what our defense is going to try to filter. This is what our defense is going to try to uh, you know, prevent like it, it, it really was seemingly a defense without a plan last year. And like I've said before, I don't really begrudge Dark Rayakovich for not coaching those dudes up to be a top 10 defense last year. The defensive talent was not there, the continuity was not there. It was a different roster seemingly every month for that team last season. It's a hard thing to build a workable defense under those circumstances. So I'm willing to give a mulligan on last year defensively for Darko Ryakovich. And I do think that 
the way Darko was able to coach the offensive principles into this team last year, they made it a point of, of emphasis. There was like no offense talk today. It was like all defense when it came to the X's and O's stuff for this team. I do think the way Darko was able to instill the way he wants his team to play offense into last year's team bodes well for how he can do that on the defensive end this season as well. And he talked a lot about kind of having pillars of non-negotiables, of just sort of core tenets of what they want their defense to be. That's a great start. Obviously, you got to put it into practice. You got to put a game plan together that makes sense. I talked on Friday about sort of what I, if I were in the coach's seat, which I'm not and never will be, would be thinking about as sort of like a base defense for this team. And I talked about, you know, a more sort of aggressive hedging defense that doesn't force Yaka Pertle to be a straight drop guy that can take advantage of the help ability of Scotty Barnes as like a mess cleaner at the rim to clean up any rotations that slip through, to take advantage of the fact that Guys like Grady Dick, Emmanuel Quickly, even R.J. Barrett, although Barrett, I think, struggles in a lot of regards on defense, but Dick and Quickly in particular, better sort of team rotational positional defenders than they are straight on ball guys. I think a hedge and recover defense kind of optimizes those skills and puts a little less onus on individual guys at the point of attack locking dudes up. That said, there was a lot of talk today about individual dudes at the point of attack locking dudes up, and I think... That's clearly been a, an emphasis for, in particular, I think Emmanuel quickly is like off-season work, you know, going to work as a point of attack guy, being a pesky defender. I, I do think it's there for quickly. I, you know, he's not the strongest guy in the world. He's not the thickest dude with the broadest chest. But I do think with his length, the, the length he has, the sort of handsiness I think he can kind of get up into, the skinniness he can kind of get into with getting over screens and fighting through. I think it all bodes well for him to be a good point of attack defender if it all clicks in and he can lock in. He talked about his conditioning being something he really worked on so he can carry both a big offensive burden, which he's clearly going to be asked to do for this team, while also having the juice to keep it going on the defensive end. Uh, you know, that's all very encouraging. I, I think I very look, it's media day. It's all about optimism. It's all about feeling good about what you heard, but and you're going to, you know, believe the things you want to believe to make yourself feel good at night. But I do think I, I buy into the whole Darko Ryakovich player development enterprise. This is a thing that has been lauded by players who have been under Darko for years. It's something Masai Ujiri talked a lot about today. It's something the players talk about with Darko and his focus on player development. And, and you know, obviously the human stuff with him is very, uh, you know, highly praised as well. But he seems to have a plan for how he wants to maximize guys and get them to the next step in their careers. And there seems to be a lot of buy-in. And I think if that on-ball pressure stuff for quickly can come, that changes the shape of this defense. I think Darko Ryakovich had some really interesting stuff to say about sort of the value of the point of attack in his defense that he wants to build. He talked a little bit about the MIG, the most important guy, and how typically the guy who's at the rim cleaning up messes is seen as the MIG in basketball terms. Uh, in his defense, it seems like the MIG is going to be the guy guarding the ball and, and containing the ball. And that puts a lot of pressure on quickly on Grady Dick if he's guarding wings, on Scotty Barnes and RJ Barrett if they're guarding wings as too. Um, if they're guarding wings, is, uh, if they're guarding wings as well. Uh, <laughs> wow. Uh, yeah, I, I think I sounded like Gollum there. Anyway, what am I saying? Uh, yeah, I, I think the on-ball stuff is going to be a really important thing to watch. We'll see if it comes through and there's actual growth there from guys like Quickly and RJ as on-ball defenders. I think Jakob Pertl, as much as as the big, he's less of an on-ball guy. They did talk a lot today, too, and Jak talked about this. Sort of, They want their defense to prevent ball handlers from getting to their go-to stuff, from keeping them away from the stuff that they want to get to. And typically a defense that's really useful for that in the modern NBA where you don't want to be giving lead guards the opportunity to kind of get downhill or, you know, pull up threes on your head. You know, I think a hedge and recover defense does a lot to help deter, deter ball handlers from doing that where, where it's like, uh, you know, when you're hedging, if you're the big man, just to kind of paint a picture here, you're coming up really high and you're kind of trying to divert the ball handler away from their preferred path. And that is kind of what they talked about today. I wonder if we'll see some ice principles. Shout out Tom Thibodeau, where it's all about the guard kind of getting ahead of the screen and pushing the ball handler to the side they don't want to be going to. Um, you know, I wonder if we'll see some of that. That, I think, would, you know, again, sort of 
fall in line with the way they described how they want their guards and bigs to play defense. I'm excited to see them actually have a plan on defense. This was a thing that they just did not have last year. And look, I think it's very possible that it looks a lot like last year's offense did, where the process was there, the schemes made sense for the players on the team, optimized skills, all of that. But without high-end personnel to carry out their schemes, you know, it gets a little bit tricky and the results probably don't match the quality of the process just because the talent's not there. This is not a super talented defensive roster, but it's more about establishing expectations, establishing pillars, non-negotiables, as Darko Ryakovic put it. And you would, in theory, if you have those pillars, you have those core sort of principles of how you're going to play as you then level up the talent, whether it's by outside addition or guys in-house improving and you know they have a couple defensively oriented prospects we'll get to in a second here obviously quickly and barrett i think are two really key figures in this uh, kelly olenic referred to rj playing the best defense he's ever seen we'll see i have my doubts about that but we'll see um but either way like once the talent's there once the talent comes up and can, can kind of match the quality of the process and the scheme then you start to get results and, and i think maybe we'll see the process be there this year and the results maybe have to come next year seasons after that but hey, maybe they surprise and are better than the 25th defense or so, which I'm kind of projecting them to be. Maybe they can flirt with being, you know, a top 20 defense. If they can do that, I think that's huge. I think that's a great step in the right direction. I'm looking for like Dwayne Casey era Raptors defensive progression. Think about back in like 2012, 2013. The thing Dwayne Casey brought was, yeah, okay, like the team's not very good, but we're going to play defense the way we're going to play defense. And we're going to get a little bit better every single year. And, and hopefully, that's something we'll see here as, you know, the schemes, again, sort of match the talent level as the guys come into their own or outside additions are made. Um, that's kind of my read on things for this year. I think we're going to see actual defensive process these, this year. I think that's going to be something that is a hallmark of what they're doing. It's, it sounds like something they're going to make a, a point of emphasis, much like they made the offense the point of emphasis of last year's team. And, and I'm pretty encouraged by that. I do think this means we probably get a chance to see a little bit more Jonathan Mobo and Jamal Shedd than maybe we thought we would. I, I think with all they said about this being a building year, about this being a season for development over winning every single last minute, I think that probably entails playing Mobo and Shedd, two guys who are very defensively talented, two of the more sort of naturally defensively gifted guys on the team not to mention the size profile of Jonathan Mobo, which is badly needed on this roster right now. His potential to be a small ball five or a wing defender or whatever. Like, I just think there's going to be room for those guys to play if they're trying to optimize what they can do defensively this season. There are going to be growing pains. Rookies are usually bad at defense, but I would like to see those guys get a look if that's really what they're going for here. If they're really going to try to ratchet up the ball pressure and kind of make it nasty for ball handlers to operate i mean jamal shed did that as well as anybody in all of college basketball over the last four years at houston why not give him a shot in the nba to go piss some other ball handlers off you got davion mitchell too if you can kind of have some pest defenders and you can use mobo's length and he can be someone you throw on wings on the perimeter maybe that helps you get to where you want to get again probably not this year it's just rookies are bad at defense overall the defensive talent on this team isn't crazy high but i i'm just I was encouraged by the defense talk today being so it very much reminded me of how offense was centered in everything they talked about last year. And again, the offensive results weren't incredible last season, but the process was there. The location effective field goal percentage, the sort of the what an average team would shoot from the places the Raptors shot last year. Top 10 quality in the league. That's great. That's really encouraging. You'd hope that this year they approach that a little closer with what their offense is capable of. And again, the defense is kind of on that one year lag time, too. And hopefully the the foundation building they can do defensively this season portends good things for the defense down the line. We're going to come back on the other side and get some rapid fire thoughts, uh, you know, sort of emptying the notebook, as it were, from media day. And, uh, you know, it, it was a, it was a tough one in particular for Masai Ujiri regarding Dikembe Mutombo. I want to talk about his thoughts there uh, on Mutombo's passing. Um it was really tough, really hard to watch Masai go through it the way he did, but I, I thought he said some really beautiful things, and I just wanted to highlight that and some other notes from Media Day to close out the show. We'll get to that coming up in a sec. Today's show is brought to you by FanDuel and NFL fans. You can start the season with a big return on FanDuel, America's number one sportsbook. 
So when you get a hunch in the middle of the game, you can check out latest stats, view live play-by-play, and so much more on the same page where you place your bets. You'll get started with $200 in bonus bets guaranteed when you place your first $5 bet. It's also not just football, of course. I'm not much of a football watcher, but you know, if, I, if you know, there's other sports that you like, like basketball, of course, the baseball playoffs are coming up soon. Hockey's starting as well. The WNBA playoffs are going strong. It's all there for you. Uh, if you want to go and, and throw some money down on the sporting event of your choice, you can go do that at FanDuel. There's all kinds of great ways to peruse on their easy-to-use app and, and find that the vets you want to make, make your bets on. May find the bets you want to make your bets on. You can tell I'm a very schooled wagerer. Either way, futures bets, Raptors over unders, all that stuff, it's over there. Go check them out. That's fanduel.com. Get started with 200 bucks in bonus bets guaranteed when you place your first $5 bet. Fanduel, the number or the number one sports book in North America and the official sports book of the Lockdown Podcast Network. Wrapping it up here, your media day takeaways episode of Locked On Raptors and just wanted to run through some rapid fire thoughts uh, that, you know, I was kind of coming away thinking about after media day. I think I've hit the broad strokes things pretty well. Um, I, I think the first thing I want to hit on the Raptors really seem to believe in Emmanuel quickly that he was really central to a lot of what they talked about. And it makes sense that he's paid him 32 and a half million bucks a year to be their point guard for the next five years. Like, of course they're bought in. Of course they're going to sell a bill of goods on Emmanuel quickly after doing that, but I'm kind of buying what they're selling, man. I, I, I'm encouraged. There was lots of talk about him and Scotty Barnes and almost just as encouraging. There was a lot of talk about him and Jakob Pertle kind of working on their connection, texting back and forth to figure out how they can best optimize themselves, where they each like the ball, where they want to sort of work in their two-man game and how they can best optimize that. You know, Jakob talked about how it felt like a pretty natural chemistry last year when they first got to play together. They didn't get to play together very much and there was still a lot to learn the nuances of those two guys in a two-man game together. Uh, and I think, you know, Jakob Pertle Emmanuel quickly pick and roll is going to be a core base set of this team this season. A lot of their stuff is going to flow out of that, whether it's just straight, you know, dumping off to Pertle for buckets in the paint, or they kind of use it to parlay into that sort of offensive machine where it's, you know, pick and roll, drive, kick, uh, you know, short roll, cutter, off, you know, off ball action with Grady Dick flying around a screen. Like there's all kinds of stuff you can do around the orbit of a Yaka Pirtle, Emmanuel quickly pick and roll because of the way Pirtle can score around the rim, because of Pirtle's passing ability from the short roll, from the nail area, as he gets closer to the rim rail, the, 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 the dump off ability, the quickly floater, the quickly rim proficiency, which went up, even though the frequency still wasn't there. He shot better than 70% at the rim last season for the Raptors. Like those two guys in tandem, that's going to be a source of a lot of the good things that happen for this Raptors offense this year. Uh, and I just think they really seem to believe in quickly as like a worker, as a dude, as a guy who's going to get in the gym. Like these are the types of guys who the Raptors have had a lot of success believing in over the years. DeMar DeRozan, Pascal Siakam, these sort of gym rat dudes who just work their asses off. It very much seems like Emmanuel quickly falls into that camp as well. I think he's in line for a big season and uh, th again, they feel very much bought in on quickly. They are positioning him as one of the key members of this team. I think he was the second guy to talk today that usually tells you something about what they think about guys. Um, if you're trying to read between the lines a little bit, I I'm, I'm buying what they're selling on quickly. I, I thought he was you know, sort of one of the key guys that I, you know, I felt like was front and center to everything they had to say today. Um, one thing that's disappointing so, look, I've seen the pictures going around of Grady Dick hatching from an egg wearing the purple front black back jersey from the Vince Carter era of the Raptors. That's great. It seems like that's going to be their third jersey. Awesome. Very excited. I was kind of despondent to see all the players come up to the podium in the same boring-ass plastic practice jersey-looking white home jersey with the red chevron that I think everybody hates. 30th season. A perfect chance to rebrand. I'm a pound on the table to just go back to the original jersey scheme and colors and dinosaur for a year now for the 30th season. Doesn't seem like that's happening. I feel like it's a missed opportunity to make lots of money off of rubes like me. I'm no business person, but I don't know, man. I, I was really, really hoping that the jerseys of the last few years were behind us. Doesn't seem like they are. 
I'm pretty thrilled that the the Vince Carter dunk contest purple jersey, um, not the, the the special city jersey, which you know maybe I'll come around a little bit. It's more of a hoodie than a jersey to me. Um, but like the purple front black back from those eras of the Raptors making the playoffs with Vince, I'm all for that being a jersey. If they want to wear it 35 times this year, I'm all in. Uh, I, I don't want to see the white home jersey like ever. It's a bad jersey. It stinks. I don't know why it exists. And I was a little disappointed to see that that is not out of the rotation officially. Maybe they, maybe it's a front. Maybe they're still awaiting a, a big reveal of a jersey redesign and a court redesign. But like, I saw a couple of like tweets going around saying that the Raptors are going with purple as a primary color this year. Uh, to me, primary means uh, like your court has it and your main set of jerseys has it. And it seems like the main set of jerseys is the status quo, which uh, bums me out big time. But we'll get over it, I'm sure. We've survived the last few years with these not very good jerseys. I'm sure we'll survive again with a couple of fun sprinkled in. A couple, couple of fun ones sprinkled in. Um, lastly, I, I just want to close on Masai Ujiri, who came back out to the dais after the news that Dikembe Mutombo had passed. Um, this one, this was tough. This was like a, a really heavy thing to watch Masai kind of sort through. I give Masai like all kinds of credit for doing that, for being as sort of vulnerable and emotional as he was. Dikembe Mutombo very obviously meant a whole lot to Masai Ujiri. And as he outlined, Dikembe Mutombo meant a whole lot to basketball in Africa, to the continent of Africa, to the pipeline of players coming out of Africa now. It, Dikembe is one of the trailblazers and his philanthropic efforts. Masai spoke a lot about the work he did, you know, the, the, the hospitals he's built back in the Congo, um, you know, just sort of always being this present at Giants of Africa, basketball without borders. I, I was just, I was blown away with what Masai had to say about him. I thought he, like, again, under really impossible circumstances, minutes after learning that his friend and mentor Dikembe Mutombo had passed, from brain cancer at age 58, coming out and kind of overcoming the the tears that he was very clearly fighting back and failed to fight back for stretches. Like, I, I thought it was just as crappy as a situation as it was, I thought it was beautiful that Masai was there to say those words today about Dikembe Mutombo and just kind of really lay out what he meant as a person, as a giant, as, as Masai said. Um, you know, when you think about Giants of Africa, like very clearly Dikembe Mutombo is somebody that Masai Ujiri is, you know, feels is very much sort of emblematic of that whole program he runs. I, I think, you know, clearly Dikembe, I mean, who doesn't know Dikembe at this point? The, the you know, obviously there's been a, a long, rich history of players from Africa playing for the Raptors. And a lot of them, all of them seem to, in some way, Look back to Dikembe Mutombo as someone who laid the path for them. Serge Ibaka had a beautiful post today sharing the clip against the Suns from back a few years ago where he had a block on Alex Len. He does the no, no, no with uh, with Mutombo sitting baseline next, you know, in, 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 sorry, not baseline, courtside. Um, you know, Bismack Biombo, no, no, no. Like very clearly some direct influence there. Um, Pascal Siakam on the line. You know, it, it was really touching to see Masai be as articulate and thoughtful as he was in laying out what Dikembe Mutombo meant to him. I think you felt it. And it was, you know, like, again, he shouldn't have had to do that. You know, there's the circumstance no one should have to face where minutes after learning of the death of someone who meant that much to you and your home continent, you're then on the dais. You know, it's not like he was forced. I think he wanted to be there and say something. Um, but like no one should ever have to deal with that in such a quick turnaround. That's got to be really challenging for the whole morning process. And I thought Masai, what he had to say was beautiful. It was emblematic of what makes Masai Masai. I, I think um, that was uh, probably, again, not the, it's hard for you to say the highlight because uh, of the horrible news that he was talking about. But I'm going to remember Masai Ujiri reflecting on the giant who was Dikembe Mutombo on Raptors Media Day for the rest of my life. That's just going to be burned in my brain. Because it was beautiful, it was thoughtful, and it really, I think, laid out the imprint that Dikembe Mutombo had. So, a um, bit of a sad note to go out on today, but I, I think it's worthwhile because I, I think what Masai had to say was absolutely beautiful, and I'm thankful that I got to be there to hear it. I'm thankful that, um, you know, if it was going to happen, 
for it to happen at a time where Masai was able to go and deliver that address. I, I, I just, uh, it was really, really beautiful. And I, I think, uh, again, it's going to be kind of a lasting thing for me. Certainly, as I think about Dikembe Mutombo, as I'm sure a lot of NBA fans are today. Uh, we're going to leave it there. Thank you so much for tuning into the show and for supporting and all the good stuff. Of course, you can find the show wherever you get your podcast, follow, subscribe, rate, review. We'll be back again tomorrow. Vivek Jacob will be along as we continue to tee up the season and get ready for things here. Um, also, uh, a reminder, again, in the description will be the link for the Indian Residential School Survivor Society here on National Truth and Reconciliation Day. Every child matters. Um, and uh, with that, we will leave it. Thank you so much for tuning in. We'll talk to you on Tuesday in the episode of Locked on Raptors. Bye-bye.